stuff for today. Um, so I think to Travis did well. Yeah, so first and foremost, thank you guys. Um, sorry about the change up. There was a little bit of a miscommunication, uh, but we will be we will be talking about JavaScript. You'll be seeing a lot of JavaScript. You will be seeing some ES6, um, as well as TypeScript. I hope it's OK uh, that we talk about the mean stack, uh, going from zero to mean in 30 minutes. Um, so this, this talk is going to be a little bit different than most mean talks. Uh, we're not just going to learn about the mean stack. I'm actually assuming that all of you already know about the mean stack. We are actually going to be building something in, about, in the 30 minutes that we have uh, to uh, to do this. Do you guys mind if I shut that door? Yeah. I'll shut it for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the reason is, is I typically record these videos and I put them on YouTube. Um, so if anybody goes and watches YouTube, if I can move really fast, you guys can come back to my YouTube channel and um, I'm going to be putting all of my, this video as well as there's a lot of other videos that I have out there um, on my YouTube channel. All right, so let's get started. We're going to go zero to mean in 30 minutes. Another thing that I like to do is I like to um, offer all of the materials uh, for you guys to follow along. So this presentation is available on the web. You can go to TravisTibble.com presentation zero to mean. I've also uh, published the, the app that we're going to be building today. Um, at the location travestable.com zero to mean spelled out. This is the app that we're going to be building. And then all of the source code for this application will be at uh, github.com Travis T zero to mean. We will be using Angular 2, which uh, uses TypeScript, but it's a, which is sit, essentially an extension of ES6. Um, so it's a, it's a very um, up and coming type of language. Uh, so if, if any of you guys are interested in Angular 2, um, as well as the mean stack, that's what we'll be doing today. And this is how you can follow along. So we are going to, in the, about 30 minutes time, we are going to build a complete event registration system. Um, this includes user logins, user registrations, all of the CRUD capabilities of creating events, editing events, deleting events, and an index of events. And yes, we're going to do that in 30 minutes. It's a pretty ambitious goal. Uh, uh, most mean videos that you guys watch uh, or tutorials you walk through, it's a pretty arduous process. You have to build the server, then you have to build the application that sits on top of the server. We're going to be lever leveraging a lot of um, very amazing tools. Every single tool we're going to leverage is open source. That's going to allow you to rapidly build a mean application in 30 minutes time. Before we get started, though, I think it's important to really talk about the structure of mean web applications. So essentially, what the way that they're structured is the application exists all on its own. It's completely separated from the server. They call these serverless apps. That's another term that you've probably heard being thrown around right now. And these applications exist within they can be deployed on a mobile device. You can compile them using Cordova as a native application. You can host them in GitHub pages, which is what we're going to do towards the end of the, the presentation. But they exist entirely on their own, and they only communicate to the server via REST APIs. It's a very important distinction to make about these type of applications is that they only talk to server via REST, which is that API that you see there. On the server side, you have Node.js. And Node.js connects to a schemaless database called MongoDB. One important thing that I like to mention is that, in my mind, mean does not necessarily have to entail these technologies. Almost definitely Node. But really, <coughs> Node, in my mind, is the only staple in mean. On the application, you can use React.js very successfully. There's a lot of other uh, front-end technologies that you can build your app application in. And even on the database, um, there's a lot of schemaless databases that are exceptional. As well as the E, which is Express, which Express is a framework in Node.js, there's other uh, alternatives to that as well. I'm really presenting this to present it as the concept of mean, in my mind, represents the serverless REST API driven application structure. And that's what we're going to be building today. 
there are a few prerequisites that you need to get that you need to have installed on your machine in order to get started. The first one is obviously Node.js. You're going to need to install that on your server. And the next thing, just to kind of follow, help follow along, I do have some Git commands in this uh, presentation. So you'll need to install Git just so that you can follow along with this presentation. And then MongoDB has this community edition that allows you to install MongoDB on your local machine so that all of this development can happen on your local machine. Again, one thing that I will mention, we are going to be using Form.io, which is uh, uh, the company that I am in the CTO for. We have a very robust open source offering that also allows you to install the entire API platform on your local machine, and it is open source. I want to make sure that I let you guys know that everything we're going to be doing today is open source. So to get started, once you install MongoDB on your server, I know this sounds obvious, but you need to start the server. It doesn't do this for you automatically. If you don't do this, you're going to be stuck from the very beginning and you're going to have a very bad day. So make sure you run MongoD at the very beginning and make sure that your database is up and running uh, before you actually uh, follow along. Another thing that I want to talk about is an API first type of methodology. Whenever you're building these type of applications, a lot of times in historically, you, whenever you're building an application, a lot of people would say, I'm going to build this thing mobile first. We are, in a we are in a time where mobile first is no longer good enough. And we need to start thinking about what is the API going to be before we start building our applications, and I like to call that API first. What this means is you take care of your API platform first. I didn't say you have to build the API platform. You just need to make sure that you take care of it. And what we are going to be using is a, is a very great open source Form.io API platform. This is going to allow us to build our registration system. It's going to allow us to do user logins, user registrations, <coughs> and we're going to have a very easy drag and drop form builder interface to do it. It is also open source. What that means is you can install and run this on your local machine. It's very liberally licensed so that you guys can extend it you can put it into your own servers and just have fun with it. I will also mention, even though we're not going to be doing this in this presentation, you don't have to run Form.io on your local machine. You can also get a free account at form.io and set up a project and that becomes your API for what we're about to go through today. But because this is a video where I want to really show you how to get your hands dirty, we're going to be using the open source server installed on our local machine. So the first thing we need to do is we need to set up the API platform, which is Form.io. We're going to clone the GitHub repo. We're going to change the directory into the Form.io directory. We're going to type npm install, and then we're going to type node main. And I'm going to actually do this just so that we can see how this works. So right now, I'm actually inside of that directory. I just downloaded the server, and I'm going to type node main. What Excuse me. What this is going to do is this is going to ask me a couple of questions to get the API platform installed. I just need to answer yes to the first one. The next one asks me what ap application would we like to get started with. We're, we're going to build our own application, so for this I'm just going to select one. And then I just need to input my root account that's going to be used to log into the system. I'm just going to put just my email and just a dummy password. And once we do that, the API platform is just installed within my local Mongo database, and the API platform is essentially running at this, at this uh, address. So I can go over to my browser, hit enter, and I will see that I have my API platform. Of course, I'm already authenticated, but if I weren't, this is the first page you would see. I'm going to pro provide the credentials I provided whenever I installed it. And here we are, we have resources and we have forms. So within Form.io, you have the ability to build these database objects, but you do so in, with, by using these forms. So we're gonna build an event registration system. Um, before I do that though, before I actually build a resource, let's get a little bit familiar with this. Obviously, you want users to create accounts, so that's where the user resource is. I can input, I can create new users by just inputting data here. But I can also edit this form 
to extend the model. So let's say I want my users to have first name and last name. This is a form builder, so I can drag on a text field, type first name, drag on another field called last name, come down here and I press save. So not only have I edited the form, but I've also edited the API behind this thing. This is entirely API driven. So by just changing and mod uh, modifying the form, I've modified the API behind this. To show you what the API looks like, if I, this is at localhost 3001, if I just go to localhost 3001 and go to my user form, which is what, what I just edited, you'll see that that pulls up this JSON schema. This is how the forms are represented in Form.io. So all of this work has been done for you through a very simple interface. And as you can see, there's my first name field that we added. This also creates the API needed for all of the submissions, create, read, update, delete, index, as well as searching capabilities and all the like. You can tell it what to do when you submit. So like, let's say, for example, I want my application to send an email when a new user is created. I've got a number of different actions to pick from. I can shoot, shoot off an email and it says, hey, this new user was created and the platform will just do it. I, we have role assignments. I can do uh, SQL queries, although that's going to be eventually be deprecated. I can log in, save submission, reset password. Obviously, on, on the hosted platform at Form.io, you have a lot more integrations to pick from, such as Google spreadsheets and the like. But this is the open source, so we are, we're limited to just the open source actions. I can also decide who has access to do what. So I can lock down my APIs to have these permissions that wrap around them so I can ensure that people can only do certain things within the, within the API platform. Because this is an event registration system, we need to build, a, we need to create an event resource. So I'm gonna to go to new resource, so I'm gonna type event. I'm gonna give it a title. I'm gonna give it a description, which is a text area. And I'm also going to give it a start and end date, but let me just play around with some of these layout components. I can actually split it up into columns, as you can see right there. And then I can drag a date time inside one of those columns. So I'm going to give this to the start date. And I'm going to drag another date time component right over here and make this the end, the end date. If you can build a form, you can build an API. By hitting create, I not only built the form that I'm going to use in my application, but I also automatically generated the REST API that we need for our system. One other thing that I would like to do is uh, change the access of the event so that authenticated people can create their own. And actually, by default, it does that. I just want to make sure that when you create an account within this event system, you have the ability to create your own events and manage your own events. If you want users to be able to see other users events you can under read all submissions you can say authenticated now if you log in as an authenticated user you have access to all the events so you can kind of see how this this permission system kind of plays out makes it real easy to configure the rules and permissions on who should have access to what so as far as the api is concerned guess what we're done We've just created all the APIs necessary to build our application. We are now going to shift our focus over to the application where we're going to build the event registration system that sits on top of this. So I'm going to head back over to my presentation and move on. So we just walked through the installation. We just got a little bit of a tour of, of what this looks like. Here's the API platform, which I also showed you. We built an event. Now we're ready to build the application. As I mentioned before, we're going to be doing this in Angular 2. Angular 2 is an amazing new framework. So you're going to be learning a lot about Angular 2 in this presentation. You're going to be also be learning about JavaScript. We're going to be doing some JavaScript as well. The best way in my mind, in my opinion, to get started is to leverage an amazing generator called FountainJS. FountainJS actually uses a thing called Yeoman Generators. Um, have you guys heard of Yeoman Generators? They're basically like quick starts. They get th 
things set up for you, they install the right dependencies, and they get you going with a sample application. You'll be very surprised how fast we can get going with the FountainJS generator. So the way this works is you actually have to install it. You have to type npm install yo and then generator fountain web app. You're going to make a directory, mean app, and then you're going to change directory into that, and then you're going to type yo fountain web app. What you're going to see is something that looks like this. I know it's kind of hard to see from where you are, but basically what this does is it walks you through a number of questions asking you how do you want to structure your application. You can create an application in React.js this way. The first one says which framework would you like to use? I said Angular 2. It tells you which type of module management do you want to use. These days I like to use Webpack with NPM. That's an option. It also says which JS preprocessor do you want to use? Because we're in Angular 2, I, put, I pick TypeScript. You can pick SAS for your CSS preprocessor. I just hit enter on the continuous integration. And then it says, do you want a sample app? I said yes. And then of course I want to use the core Angular router. You hit enter. This thing churns through a number of installations. And at the very end, it spits out a working web app that we can get started on. That web app looks something like this. And I'm just going to run, I'm going to type npm run serve just so that we can see what it looks like. So I'm going to go over to my app. I'm right now at the point where we just installed it. Fresh installation. And I'm going to type npm run serve. This is doing some Webpack stuff. It's doing some loaders within TypeScript. Webpack uses these things called loaders. You have to give it a minute. Is it possible you can show the package from JSON to show where the Webpack is? Yeah, sure. What, what, what Webpack is trying to serve in this context? Of course, yeah. So right here we have localhost 3000. That's where it's actually serving. So if I go back over to my browser, I'm now going to go to there. And here we are. We have a web application that's just been started. We're ready to, we're ready to rock and roll, start building this web app. You asked a question about the package JSON. NPM run serve, all it does is type, it's an alias for gulp serve. And so this uses gulp package uh, uh, task manager. I, I need was trying to ask, uh, where, where, do you, where do you use the web pack in this? So why would I need to use web pack? Can I not use just any? You can use, you can use system JS, you can use any other type of module, module system. I, I just, uh, you can actually tell whenever Yeoman is installing, if you have a preference for something else, it, you can tell it and it'll build it in that way. Okay. I'm going to change this to the, just give me a minute, I'm going to make it so you guys can see this, because we are going to start looking at code here in a minute. Where is it? You're right. There we go. <clears throat> Much better. Okay. So now that we have our application running, the next thing we need to do is install some modules. You can install the very first one that we're going to install is NG2 Formio. That's the Formio integration module. It also provides the renderings of the forms. We're also going to use Bootstrap. So you're going to install Bootstrap SAS. Bootswatch will allow us to change the theme, so we can go to Bootswatch and pick whatever theme we want. Lodash is a like a utility Swiss Army knife type of uh, library. We're also going to be using some file loaders. Webpack has this thing called loaders. Whenever it's actually building your application, anytime it runs into a URL, it passes that through what's called a loader. And these basically tell Webpack how to build it. And then, of course, ES6 Promise Loader, because we're going to be using ES6. It needs to know uh, how to load promises and the like. I've already done this, this step in my, my code base, so I can skip over this part. All right, so let's get started. So once we actually have, we need to, we need to tell um, our webpack 
that A, we're using Bootstrap, so Bootstrap needs fonts. That's what we have right here. So this is gonna tell Webpack that we're gonna, we're gonna load some fonts. Anytime it runs into a font file, it needs to go out and load it. And then we also need this load children loader. We're gonna be using this because we're gonna be, we're gonna be leveraging a thing called lazy loading within Angular 2. So all we do is we go inside of our config file under the Webpack config, Webpack disk config, and then we start adding, the, adding these. So I'm just gonna copy this just so that I can be quick about it. I'm gonna go into my configuration. Here's the first one, Webpack config. You'll see there's the first one. I just need to add that. The disk config, I just need to add that. And test config, I need to add that. I now need to add a new loader. This is for the fonts. What does the lazy loading do? So lazy, uh, I'll explain that in a minute. It's amazing. So lazy loading. Yeah, just one second. So lazy loading allows you to have modules. And instead of whenever your application boots up, you having to load everything in your entire application. So let's say there's a, there's a page called About Us. And you don't really want to load all of the About Us controllers unless the person actually clicks on About Us page. What lazy loading does is it allows you to section off these, these modules and only load the module whenever it's needed. And it re really improves the performance of your application. So now that we did that, let's actually set up Bootstrap. So Bootstrap, there's a file that's already been provided for us called app index SCSS, which is SAS. We're just going to copy this, and then I'm going to explain what it is after I copy it. We're going to go over here. We are going to select all, delete, and we're going to do paste. It's much cleaner. Let's talk about what this is doing. Actually, that font is a little bit too big. Let's try 20. So what this is doing, in fact, this could be a little smaller. So what this is doing is this is actually, first of all, it's telling Bootstrap where the font, uh, icon font path is, which is inside of the node module. We're also going to be using Bootswatch. Bootswatch allows us to change the theme. You'll see here in a minute, uh, it, it's Bootstrap, but it doesn't look like Bootstrap. It's, this will actually look like Foundation. Uh, which is a, another CSS framework. And then we're going to actually load the core bootstrap file, and then we're going to <coughs> apply the boot swatch on top of that, which is really going to provide us that custom theme. And then after that, we provide our own styles. But typically, bootstrap has you covered. So that the only styles you really need to apply are very minimal styles. Hang on a second, I'm going to change this to be there. So I don't have to keep skipping over it. After that, we want to change the nav bar. Uh, I don't know if you remember with that, the app had this default navigation bar. We want to, we want to convert that into a bootstrap nav bar. So I'm going to copy this. I'm going to go over to my IDE. I'm going to click on app. I'm going to open up the header. This is what was provided for us by Yeoman. I'm going to select all delete, and I'm going to do a paste. Now there's a gotcha with my presentation utility. It drives me crazy. And I didn't do this. The presentation library did that. This is actually supposed to be camel cased. It ends up lower casing everything that I put inside my code. I don't know why it does it, but it does. So one major gotcha is you have to turn this back into a non lower cased like that. Otherwise it's going to spit out errors and you're not going to know why. Very obscure errors that it throws at you. So now that we've done that, we're going to actually change the main content. There's a couple of things that the Yeoman Generator does that I'm a little bit, I think it's fairly opinionated. Of course I'm opinionated as well, but um, I needed to be able to leverage the main content and add a router outlet to it. That allows us to load content into a section of my app. They didn't set it up that way. So we're going to change a couple of things to make it so that that works. What we're going to do is we're going to copy this main content. We're going to go over to main.html. And I'm going to replace this right here 
with that. This router outlet is a special tag within Angular 2 that tells, tells it where to put the content for any of the routes. So if, when you load a route, you only have to provide the template that goes inside of there. And when it loads that module, it takes that template and it stuffs it, it actually it replaces router outlet with the contents of your module. We'll explain a little bit of that once we get into it. We'll, we'll be going talking about components and all of that in Angular 2. So we're also going to add a home page, okay? We want a thing that says welcome to the event manager. And then uh, this is going to be a, just a very simple template that we're going to create within our application. I'm going to copy this. Go back here. I'm going to create a home.html. And I'm just going to provide the template for this one little page. And of course, this could be this could add all, all, all kinds of content that you want to add. In Angular 2, there's this thing called a component. And a component allows you, it works a lot like a directive did in Angular 1, where you define your class that includes your template and allows you to attach a controller to it. So I'm going to say home.ts. So right here, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm importing the component. So this is some ES6 that we see right here. So there's this very important construct called an import. In the latest versions of JavaScript, they really made a great move by turning JavaScript files into what are called like modules and like components. And instead of trying to figure out the order in which you should include your JavaScript and script tags in your HTML page, they basically said, well, you could actually use this import, and it's essentially importing from an NPN module. So whenever I say import component from Angular Core, what that is really doing is that's going to these node modules, it's finding the Angular node module, it's looking in core, and then it looks for an index file, and there's the index file right here. Now this is pre-compiled, so it's going to look a little bit weird, but in here you're going to see a thing called export. And there's probably a lot of these things, but there is an export component in here somewhere. So I'm basically importing that. That gives me this class that I can ex that I can use as a. This is actually what's called a decorator. This is not an ES6 thing. This is an ES7 thing that TypeScript uses. In the decorator, I'm actually telling it where my template is. I'm saying, okay, my template is home.html. Once it does that, it looks inside of home.html and it uses this as the template for that component. And then I have to make sure I export it so that I can import it in another file. If you don't export it, you can't import it elsewhere. I thought that uh, that is a feature of a TypeScript. Why did you say that it's an ES7? Um, the add component. The, the which one? Add component. The component is a, is a the, uh, what I was saying is decorators. So th this having this at symbol here is what's called a decorator. Right, but that's part of the TypeScript language. So. It's, it's part of, so TypeScript is a superset of ES6, and it's also a superscript of ES7. ES7 has a proposal to include what are called decorators. And so all that TypeScript did is it included, it, it included what's going to be ES7. So when the time comes that you guys are ready to experiment with ES, ES7, you're going to have this thing called a decorator, and TypeScript actually leverages that. If you guys develop in Angular 2, you're actually going to be educated on even beyond what is currently the standard, which is the ES6. And decorators is one of those things. So once we do that, once we add a home page, the next thing we need to do is we need to change the route structure a little bit so that it supports this nested routing that I that I changed with my main file. To do that, I'm going to change inside of source index, we're going to actually load up the, the core module, 
which is router app instead of router root. These are actually components in Angular 2. So this is actually saying, okay, I want to use my fountain app component versus fountain root, and I'll, I'll explain why I, ha why I made that move. I'm actually getting rid of root. It was superfluous. We can actually achieve a much cleaner routing interface by just getting rid of it. Inside of my index, I'm going to import the home component, which we just created. So there, I'm importing the home component. I also need to declare it. And I need to change in the bootstrap which module it starts off with. By, de uh, by default, it was starting with root component. We're going to get rid of root component. In fact, I can even delete it from this declarations here. I'm just doing this for cleanup. Here in a minute, you'll see how you just don't even need it. The next thing I need to do is check, uh, look at this routes file. The routes file tells the application whenever I navigate to a certain path, load a certain component and have that inside that router outlet that I showed you guys previously. So inside of routes.ts, right here I'm going to import the home component and I'm going to change it so that the component that it loads at this route is the home component. What that means is I can start doing some cleanup. I can delete this. I can delete root component because we don't need it anymore. I can delete this up here. I like cleanliness. It's a lot cleaner. So now our routes file is just the routes. And you'll see here in a minute we're going to add some more routes so that it'll load some more modules. So let's actually just stop this and reload it and see what we're up, what, what it looks like now. So after making all of those changes, we made a change to the nav bar, we implemented Bootstrap, we changed the home page, and we're now ready to introduce some new pages such as user authentication, user registration, which is what we're going to do next. All right, so there we go. So now if I hit re Enter. This is basically now the app. It's very simple. There's a little nav bar at the top. There's a home button. And there's our screen that says welcome to the event manager. We're going to add a, a login up here that's going to allow people to log in. That's what we're going to do next. So with every application that I build, I like to create essentially a configuration file that's going to be used to house all of the configurations for my application. We can do this by creating a config.ts file, which is similar to JS, but it's for TypeScript. And we're going to copy the contents here. So I'm going to go over here, create a new file, config.ts. So what's going on here? All I'm doing is I'm defining some variables and everything you see on this screen is actually ES6. So I'm, in, first of all, I'm importing some previous configuration objects. These are, and actually those are, those are uh, TypeScript, those are interfaces. I'm importing some interfaces from the Formio modules. Now what I'm doing is I'm defining some constants. That's what this export const is. And this is a TypeScript thing where I'm saying it belong, it is that type, which is actually an interface. This tells, this interface tells me, it tells the application that I must declare an app URL and I must declare an API URL, otherwise it'll give me an error. And here what I'm doing is I'm pointing to the API that we just spun up. So this is the Formio API and that's my application. So whenever I run this thing, it's gonna use the API that's provided by Formio is my base API. And then I just tell it, for the auth configuration, I say I'm going to use the user login form and user register form. These are the form paths that we created inside of Formio, so I can actually show you where those exist. So if I go back to Formio and I look at my user login and user register forms over here, if I click on those, 
and I click on edit form, you will see that these have a path, user login, and the register has user register. If you wanted to mount a different form, you can do that by just changing the path. Or you can have more than one form, or more than, and it's just, it's just as easy as changing the path, and that's where those registrations come into play. So once I do that, I need to essentially pr uh, provide what is called the auth service. So inside of index.ts, I'm going to copy this, these co this lines right here. Go back to my index. And I'm now bringing in the Formio auth service and the Formio auth config. I'm also bringing in the configuration that I just created. This is that variable that we just created, which is basically the auth configuration for my application. The next thing is a little bit confusing. In fact, when you're we're just getting familiar with Angular 2, this part is a little bit strange, and I'm going to try to do the best I can to explain what's going on here. I am adding what's called a provider. So the core modules of, of Angular 2, or the core form IO modules of Angular 2, have this thing called an authentication service that is essentially a class that contains all the business logic for my authentication. What I'm doing here, though, is I'm saying that my app is going to provide the value of the authentication service. Whenever you say provide, you are basically saying, I'm the one who is declaring this object. And because I'm declaring it, the value of that object is propagated to all modules that I load inside the, uh, inside the application. So here I'm actually going to create an instance of the Formio auth service class and I'm going to provide it the value that I defined inside my configuration. So this creates the authentication service, it, it injects through dependency injection the configuration value for my auth config, creates that object and now that is going to be provided to every single module that I load, which we're going to do here in a minute. That's probably one of the biggest gotchas of Angular 2 in my mind on how the whole provider system thing works. The next thing we need to do is create an actual module which will house all of the authentication for my application. I'm going to do this by creating what's called an auth, basically a module, auth.module. And I'm going to copy and paste this code. To explain a little bit about what this is doing, all this is doing is this is me declaring my authentication and then I'm registering the routes that the core module provides. So the core module will provide user register, user login, so that whenever I navigate to those routes within my application, something happens. I can pass in a configuration here to kind of override some behaviors, but we'll do that here in a minute whenever we do um, the event system. And then at this point, I'm going to declare at the path auth in my routes, I'm going to load that module. So I'm going to go to my routes file. This is where we're going to do some lazy loading. What this is doing is this is when this basically says when I navigate to the path auth in my application, I am going to load this auth module, which we just created, and I'm going to instantiate the auth module class. You'll also see all of this craziness on the left-hand side. That's only because I'm using Webpack. If you're not using Webpack, you will not include what I just highlighted. It's just one ma major thing to, to take note of. Webpack needs that so that it knows how to load it. It's using the ES6 promise loader to do it, and it loads up that module in a promise. We also need to change the navigation bar so that we have our login links up at the top of the navigation. This can be done pretty easily. I'm just going to copy this code here. I'm going to go to the header that we just created. And I'm going to add this right here. And keep in mind, it lowercase everything. So I need to change that to a capital L, that to a capital A. It lowercase the ng if. If you don't do this, it will crash. 
and you won't know why. I think that's all of them. And then the next thing I need to do is I need to make sure that I include the auth service in the header. The reason is, is because you'll notice inside of the template of the header, I'm referring to this auth object. The only way that this module, this template has access to that variable is if I inject it into the component. So the component for the header is right here. I just need to inject the auth service. Keep in mind the auth service was created by the index. This is where it's providing the value and it's providing the value for everything underneath it. So here I'm basically in the constructor of the header component. I'm declaring a variable that's private that's being injected by the auth, per, auth service provider. This will provide the values that I need uh, for my service so that I can use it within the header. Now, what I need to say, when I log in, I want to redirect the user to the home page. So whenever you got to type my username and password, they log in, they need to be redirected to the, to the home page. So I'm going to do that inside of the main component because the main component is kind of like the wrapper around everything. I'm going to include my router and auth service and inside of a constructor I'm going to inject the auth service, inject the router and what this is doing is this is now subscribing to some events from the auth service. This says whenever the event login is fired I want to navigate using my router to the home page. In the event that the logout is triggered, I want to navigate to the home page. In the event that register is triggered, I want to navigate to the home page. This gives you full control over how this thing navigates as they're doing certain things within authentication. And after we've done that, let me restart my app. We should now have Login and registration. Give it a minute. Come on. There we go. So now if I hit refresh. You'll see I've got my, my login register screen up here. If I click on this, I go to a page which loads the forms that I just created. This is dynamically loading those forms from my form IO system. And I can even register. I'm going to register a new account. So I'm going to say, and when I hit submit, that actually created a registration logged me and authenticated me and it navigated me back to the home page. I can see this account if I go back to Form.io and look at users and look at view data, you'll see that I just created this account right here. Now you might be saying, why did you not get the first name and last name? I can add first name and last name very easily to the registration by editing the form, going over to my user account here, dragging the first name, and the last name, clicking save. I go to my action and then I just need to make sure that I pass along those values to the resource. Oh, something didn't like something. Hopefully my server's still running. Try that one more time. Yeah, doesn't like something. I'll have to look into that. But I did modify the form so that if I log out and I go to register, you'll now see first name and last name is in my registration. All right, we're on the home stretch, guys. Let's actually build the 
the next component, which is the event resource. Well, there is the, the registration is putting the information. Did you go to that part, or is it not in the information that you're filling? The, net, it's all getting stored in MongoDB, which is local on my machine. Okay. So it's hitting the API, the API is storing the record in Mongo database, it's generating an auth token and handing that back to the application. All of that is done for you with the providers, the Formio providers. So we did create the event within Formio. We now just need to bring that into the application. You do this by creating a module. So we're gonna create this event module and inside the event module, we're just going to copy and paste this code, and I'm going to explain what this code is as I do it. So I'm bringing in all of my imports, but one thing that I am doing is I'm registering the resource routes. What this does is this provides all of my CRUD-based routes. Create, read, update, delete, index. I can view a file. I can. You can do all of that, and then at that point, I'm going to provide the Formio resource service and tell it which form it should link up to. So I just created an event form, and here I am, I'm providing this to the service saying, here's your value. You should, you should link yourself to the event form within Formio, and that does it. The next thing I need to do is I need to mount the resource to the routes. I'm going to do that in my route system. And now once I refresh my browser, I will be able to navigate to all of the event routes. I'll be able to go to event. Let me just show you. Next. Here's all the things that I'm going to have inside of my application by just doing that. I just created a, a module, I mounted it, and now if, let me just log in as, the, as an administrator, admin account. Now you, you know, I don't have a link, but I can go to event. And you'll see I can create a new event, and that's loading the form that I built inside of Formio. Okay, so I can say, New event. Give it a start date. All of this is provided by Formio. So I go all, even like these widgets and everything, and I hit submit. I've got edit capabilities, so I can edit the event, I can delete it, I can even do the index again. So with just a few lines of code, I've created an entire CRUD-based um, system within my event system. We're almost done. Now that we've done that, we just need to override. So now, now a very common request is, if you actually look at this, and I go click on this, the view is actually a filled out form, but disabled. Most people who develop applications want to have a custom view of what they want the event page to look like. So what we've done is we've provided a very easy way for you to override the templates for view, edit, delete. All of, the view, all of these are, are easily editable. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to import this Formio resource view component from Formio Directive. So I'm going to go back to my, where is this? This is the event module. And inside here, I just need to come over here and I need to import the view module, view component. And then I'm going to extend it. I'm going to use ES6 classes to extend the view component to provide my own stuff. And you're going to do that by using extends. I need to make sure I bring in component from Angular 2. So here's basically all I'm doing is I'm saying I'm going to extend the, the view component, but I'm going to provide my own template. Now, you might even want to inject your own business logic. You can, in these classes, create your own methods, create your own business rules for the view page. I'm going to create a new event HTML document. Oh, I also need to import. I, I do need to declare the event view component. It's one thing that I'm missing. So down here, I need to create a declarations 
and declare it. That's, that allows Angular 2 to know that we have a new class that's available. And then the next thing I'm going to do is create an uh, event.html and I'm going to build this custom view. This could be whatever template you want it to be, but I'm just going to have the header up there at the top. I'm going to put the description in, the, in a page element. And then I have the start and end date. You could have like a calendar if you wanted. And then I'm going to add a, a link to the header just to kind of finish it off. Fix my lower cases here. Make sure you do that, otherwise it won't work. And then at that point, I can come back to my application, refresh the page. It's probably rebuilding, just give it a minute. got this link up here at the top called events. I can click on that. That takes me to my events. I can click on this view. Oh, I know what I missed here. I created the class, but I didn't register it. So if I go back to my event module, now that I've created the class, I need to make sure that in the Formio resource routes, I tell it, hey, for the view, use that component instead. And what that's telling it is it's now saying use that component for the view. And then whenever I do that, once it refreshes, I now have that template that I'm extending the, the core component. So I'm essentially at this point, have an entire working event management system. I've got logins, I've got register, and I've got the ability to create events, edit events, delete events. And if I wasn't really trying to go slow and talk you guys through it, we could, we could have done that in 30 minutes. But I wanted to make sure that I went slow enough so that I just didn't blow, you know, go way too fast. Can you show your routes again, please? Yeah, of course. So if I look at the routes, this is what they look like. Um, not as many as you would think for having all those routes because a lot of them are provided by Form.io, the, the, the core module. All I'm doing here is I'm just saying, hey, when they hit the event route, load the event module, and then the event module takes over. The event module provides its own routes, but it does so through the use of the, the Form.io resource routes uh, provider. How do we get to see what are all the possible so let me, let me if to, to do that, let's just take a look at some source code. So we can go to github.com, ng2 formio. In here, there's a source folder, there's a modules folder, and there's a resource folder. We can click on this index right here. And right here, you're going to see that Formio resource routes where I can pass in my configuration. So there's a new, this will allow me to create, this is my, my C in CRUD. Here is the ID, so if you have a resource, it goes to the ID. Within, within that, we have view, edit, delete. And this is, uh, nothing is the index. So it, that gives me all of my CRUD paths built out for me, and then it, you'll see here where I can override through the configuration, say, no, use this component instead of the, the base component. So by extending one of these base components and providing it in the configuration, I essentially have this full extendable system, uh, resource extension system. Everything else is really driven by this resource service.
there's a lot there's a lot of code I mean it's not like crazy amount of code but this does like the loading of the resources loading of the forms manages the saving of the submissions deleting the submissions and the like so that's that's what that looks like So we have a complete event management system at that point, which we just demonstrated. The next thing that you'll probably want to do is launch the app. Um, get this out on the web. You can easily do that as well by using this Yeoman uh, facility called npm run build. What that does is it compiles a distrib distributable, distributable application inside the disk folder. So if I go over here, and I try npm run build. What that's doing is it's kind of getting everything, it's cleaning it, it's building it, it's creating a Webpack distribution. Takes a minute, just because it's got to compile all the JavaScript. It's compacting it, it creates a distribute, uh, it creates tokens on the JavaScript file so the next time you load it, It'll refresh the next uh, version of JavaScript files. It does all of this for you. And it creates a package that you can then push to a website and it'll run as like a serverless application. Let's give it a minute. And it's done. So let's just take a look at what that did. So if I look at my directory here, you'll see that there's this dist folder. This dist folder is what that actually did. So if I go inside and look at what, what's in here, you'll see there's really not much in here. In fact, there's one thing that matters, which there's this index.html. If I were to look at that, it would be a minified, it's, it's basically highly optimized. It brings all the JavaScript into a main file, brings all the CSS into one file, and it has like, I don't know what these files are. I think those might be like resources of some sort. But it basically creates a package that I can then deploy to a website. And that's what I want to talk about next. Which is you can then push this to a thing called GitHub Pages, which will host your application for free of charge. So you go to a GitHub account. You create a project in your GitHub account and you push that dist folder, git push origin master gh pages, and you then have an application. I actually did this myself, so let me just show you where that is. So if you wanna see what that looks like, if you go to github.com, I'm sorry, Travis T. So the project is zero to mean. So if you click on this zero to mean project, here's the application that I, I just created. But if I switch the branch to GH pages, you'll see that this is now that dist folder that I just created. Of course, there's some more files here, but I could clean that up if I need to. But there's the index.html. And what this does is this now hosts my website for me. So if you go to travistable.com forward slash zero to mean, it's Hosting the GitHub Pages branch which is what you see right here so this is of course I changed the header but this is the application and this is actually running on Form.io so this I have a project that I created on Form.io that has all my resources my forms so I don't even need a local server um, it's communicating to the live Form.io server here I now have an entire serverless application that's communicating to the Form.io API and I've got an event registration system. So you can actually host a serverless app free of charge, GitHub will not charge you for this, um, pointed to a project that you can create on Form.io free of charge. We won't charge you as long as you don't cross a thousand submissions a month. And you essentially have an entire hosted application for no charge. Is that data going to stay behind form of the form? Of if you're hosted on Form.io, the data is going to go to Form.io. Okay. But one major feature that we have for enterprises is we allow our entire API platform to be Docker deployed into your own environment, hook it up to your own database. So.
So, with that said, that's it, guys. Thank you so much. I only went 30 minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to follow this uh, presentation, or is it a GitHub link I can just follow? Um, the presentation is hosted, so I've, I've, this ho this is actually hosted at TravisTindall.com presentations zero to me. So you can go to that. I am going to upload this video to YouTube. Uh, my YouTube channel is I think it's Travis T three four nine. This. Um, I'm pretty sure if you go to YouTube and type M-E-A-N, you're going to see my video come up. It's uh, mean stack. Type mean stack. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it used to be at the top. <laughs> Third man scale. <laughs> oh, it's mean, mean web application. So how to build a mean web application. This is me right here. I mean, it's 150,000 views. So I mean, it's a, I did this a long time ago. And I'm going to be putting um, this video in this channel. Uh, just, just my Travis Tittle channel so that you guys can rewatch it and, and, and walk through it. And it's, it should be easy to walk through. I mean, I, I try to break it up and, and into pieces so that you can walk through the application. So, any questions? I'm doing a good job explaining all the little gotchas. It's it's hard. You know, the, um, JavaScript is moving so fast, and web application development is moving so fast. It can I, it can be remarkably frustrating just to think, just try and keep up. Because what was it two years ago? We were telling people to do things differently. Yeah. And now we're telling them use Webpack, use Node modules, use TypeScript or ES6. Um, I will give an ES6 talk uh, one of these days, and I really apologize. This this week ended up being way more crazy than I was expecting, so I ended up doing a presentation I did last week. But um, it's a lot to consume, which is why I like these helper libraries. These libraries that kind of do a lot of the grunt work for you. So that you can get something out there and kind of, you know, really the most important thing is is just to get started. Get started, understand what you're doing, do something small, and just build up from there. Don't try to build some crazy web application from your That's hard to do. So in that example, right? So the edit was only one record of edit, right? So is, well, how do you approach when you have like hundreds of thousands of records already there before you want to do mass edit? To do like a mass edit, well, it's all API driven. Um, so because everything is API driven, if you can build the interface, the UI, like the progress indicator, you know, like the, there's some there's some grid select tools that you can you can leverage. I think um, like Kindo UI Grid is a really good one. Um, those allow you to select multiple rows, and then when you hit submit, then you would have this custom controller that comes up and then just iterates over all the records and does a REST API put request. Um, so everything is REST API driven. So you can do it. It's just you'd have to write it. You know, properly. So when I build the form on my page, that's what you do. What do you call it? Is it a page or is it a component inside the form on your page? It's a page. I mean, you can call it a page. I mean, what what I just showed you guys, right? Um, on that point in page, you say I have to bring in the third party libraries or third party frameworks. Yeah, you can you can um, you can do an npm install, bring in other libraries. Um, all the all the modules and libraries you bring in, you use npm. No, no, but this is not this app, right? This is really the, my designing my form I use. When you're designing your form IO stuff. You're really building the resources within the Formio API platform. Okay, that's when you said bring in Kendo UI. That's in the app. <laughs> so think of Formio as your API engine. Okay, it's just it's just a it's really a RESTful database. Yeah, that's what I want to make sure. Okay, so the yeah. app that people right, we can bring in whatever we want. Just whatever you want. Yeah, and you you actually uh, the the server. So like I've got the server hosted here. Uh, this is open source. Uh, all of the code for Form.io is provided here. So you can go and fork it, clone it, build a custom action. So like all the actions are under source, 
actions. So here's all the actions that you saw. You can go create a new action, contribute, or keep it to yourself. And through custom actions, you can actually make the system do whatever you want it to do. You can um, send a request to some obscure third-party service when they submit the form. So the way that Form.io is designed was really built around the concept of middleware. So in Node.js, you have this thing called middleware where you can stack functions on top of one another. The actions are essentially configurable middleware. So if you want the API to do something different that it doesn't do by default, go and register and create a new action, and you'll see it in the UI. You'll, you'll see it show up. And you can select it, and then you can configure it. And then when you submit that form, your action will get triggered in, in rain. So in this way, you can ex actually extend the API platform as well. You have full control. I mean, it's all open source, so you have full access to it. I really like the human function generator, but is there any way that I can use the Angular 2 command line tool inside of I didn't find a way to do that. Yeah, the, the command line is a little bit more difficult. Than, I, I, I think the command line is a little bit more difficult than um, than the Yeoman generator. One of the reasons is is because it forces what's called ahead of time comp compilation. And there's a lot of libraries do, that do not work with AOT. Yeah, that's what I and so and so then you'll install a library that's not AOT compatible and your app breaks. Um, AOT is so Angular is really investigating this whole concept of instead of all this JavaScript code running when the app is booted we're going to ahead of time compile, compile everything. So it works more like a static site than it does a, an app. Um, but unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of components don't handle it. Okay. The other question is, I saw you have um, inject the form authenticate uh, service in the index.ts providers, and you do it again in the individual yep. class. Um, is there a reason you do that twice? Yeah, this, this, is, this is where providers become a little bit confusing. Okay. By, by me, this auth service is where you said, hey, I saw you, you included it here. Yeah. This is the index. It is providing. It's a provider. So this is providing the service mm -hmm. to other modules. Anytime that you see it in other classes, like I think in the headers, like this most yeah. simple example, I'm not providing it here. I'm consuming it. So this oh, is dependency, so no it's dependency injecting that uh, instance yeah, into my I class. I saw there is another one you, you put into the providers. I forget which one it is. Um, so that was like the event module. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, so yeah. it is an auth, not authentic. This is not the auth. Okay, that, that so you should only have one module yeah. providing the service. Yes, because if we're providing in if you have different providers, that actually is different service. They're, well, they're different instances. They're, they're in, different instances. Yeah, so in, in, you can do that. There might be a use case where you might have a, something providing the service up here, and as the module comes in, and then you have a module down here that wants to provide its own yeah. instance to its children, it can do that. Not for the identity. But that's a massive gotcha. A lot of people that don't understand providers end up doing it wrong, and they don't realize they end up with two separate instances of the service when you do that. And in your head, think I should be providing the service for once in my app. I have one question. Like I probably don't want. I want to uh, use it for different services, but I want a couple, of, like two components or three components, multiple components to use one instance of the service. How to do that? That's what. That's what we just did. If you want the, uh, everything to use one instance of the service? Not everyone. Like two or three components use one instance of the service? Then I'm they sure. will provide, they'll, they'll have a providers in their own module. Okay. And then they're basically creating their instance. So there's no way to have like couple, like multiple components to share one instance of the service? No, that, that's, that's what a provider is by default. It's if whatever the, whatever the top level module, if it says I provide this service, Every module that gets loaded underneath it okay. gets that one instance, get passed to it. So they're all sharing the same service at that point. Where you run into trouble is if you don't realize that and in the, the sub-module, you also say provides, you use this providers and you provide the service again. 
it ends up getting its own instance. So then they're separate. So by default, it's almost like a singleton. Mm -hmm. it's, you almost can think of it like a singleton because it's basically loading the service, it's instantiating it, and it's passing that down, that instance down to all of its submodules. So whenever, even, even node modules, so like uh, the way Form.io works, it's a node module. And I, I can't really show it here because it's a, the code is essentially obfuscated because it's inside of a disk folder. But inside of this module here, I'll just look at the auth one. Um, God, it looks much, much worse whenever it's compiled. It basically says that it provides, it uses the service, but it's meant to that you pass it into the, the module. And so the whole passing of module, uh, passing of provider instances even works through node modules as well. Good questions. You, I can tell you've done a lot with Angular too. I'm just dying. Okay. Formula <laughs> only work with uh, Angular? No, we work with React, okay. Angular 2. We're about to release a core JavaScript uh, library that was built in ES6. Um, so whenever I come and talk about ES6, I can show you how we built the core, what we were calling the core renderer um, in, in just ES6. And that's going to allow us to introduce it to Vue.js, jQuery, Aurelia, there's a lot of other frameworks that we're going we're gonna to introduce it to by having that core renderer. So if you wanted to validate the email, how can form my email? Uh, well, you, by default it does validate the email, but you want to do like real-time validation? Well, yeah, like make sure that it's not from a okay. Yeah, yeah, so by, if you use our hosted service, let me just open up the project here. Open up a demo project. Um, so in here, you have the ability to create a project. So this is like just an example project that we have. Um, and let's say I want to, on my user login form, I want to validate the email. The hosted service has this thing where you can validate against a, something called Kickbox. Kickbox is a company right here in Dallas. Uh, we're friends with these guys. And they do email real-time email validation. <laughs> and so what this, the way this works is you can set up your, e your registration. That'll do real-time email validation through Kickbox and it'll, it'll reject it if the email's not valid. Yeah, so we, the hosted service, we do a lot of integrations. Like we have Kickbox for emails. Um, you go to your project settings. Um, you know you got storage providers. You can you can upload S3, Dropbox. This is something that we provide. Um, you can connect to SendGrid, SMTP, Mailgun, um, Google Docs. So yeah, like we got Google Drive, Kickbox, HubSpot, a SQL connector. So if you need to connect it to a SQL database, you can do that. Lassian, which is Jira, Mokstra, which is like a communication platform. All of these are provided by the hosted service. Which is free. You can you can create a free account and, and try these. You just have to stay under a certain threshold. And this is this is basically what you just saw, but it, there's just a lot more. Like there's the hosted service we provide, like the resources we provide, app, you know, form previews. Um, you can do. Uh, multiple projects, so I can have like one project and I get a dedicated API per project. Mm -hmm. So instead of it being have just that, because the open source is really like one project. I can have, I can host like 20 on for my own. It doesn't cost anything to create a project. You can just create projects all day long. You basically get your own API that you can connect your app to. So you can build and host your entire application uh, you leveraging the APIs provided by for my own. The count that you have is it per project or for the entire account? Per project. per project. Yeah. Yeah, and this tells you right here. This says monthly API calls. This and, and actually, it's not API calls. They're submission requests. So, okay. like a form, a form request. Like if you have somebody loading the form, that doesn't count. It's only whenever people submit the form or read data from the form does it count. And uh, and so for free, you get up to a thousand. But I've got 
I mean, I've got about 20 apps out in the wild that never cross a thousand submissions a month. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, it's, you can have like your own personal website or something. It's, you know, unless unless you're really popular and you get a thousand <laughs> contact contact yeah. form requests a month, you're you're all right. You'll, you you can survive with on the free plan. Thanks, guys. Thank any any other questions? Okay. What'd you guys think? I mean, was it was it good? I'm sorry I didn't do ES6. I mean, you guys can't probably watch ES6, but we'll. No, it's really oh, good. Yeah. This is even more helpful. Huh? This is even more helpful. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think you know, like posting it on uh, GitHub, it's like wow. <laughs> yeah, and you don't have to pay for it. Exactly. Yeah, you, know you don't have to pay for GitHub. Uh, there's other. There's other providers that host, they, they call them static websites. The thing is, is you can build a working application as a serverless app and put it on like GitHub pages. Mm -hmm. And um, S3, like our, this website, it's it just a little crazy FYI. This portal uses for my API to function. So this, this, what you, this app that you see right here is actually deployed on a content lit CDN. This is not hosted on a server. <laughs> This app is hosted on a CDN, and we can do that because you can put HTML files on a CDN. And so what's great about that is our entire app, when you type form.io in, you know, let's, uh, all the way across the world in China or something, you're not, you're hitting the, the nearest content delivery network to load the app, it loads immediately. And then everything else is this API traffic. And so you get a much, much better user experience by having a serverless application Deployed in like a CDN, that would be a good talk. I could show how to how to how do you leverage like AWS CloudFront, like we do CloudFront, um, S3 buckets, CDN deployment, and then Elastic Beanstalk for auto scaling the API infrastructure. So, does Google index um, JavaScript apps? Yeah, yeah, they do now. Angular is from Google, so they've learned. <laughs> they've learned to index Angular apps. So, yeah, that'd be a good talk. I mean, I, I know a lot about that. You know, the deployments and scale, how to, how to create scalable web apps. Yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Does that mean isomorphic is dead? Um, <laughs> now it's called universal. I just yeah, universal. Yeah. Angular universal. <clears throat>